Hi everybody, my name is Alexandre Michy. Um, I'm a cardiologist working in France. I'm the head of the telecardiology working group uh, from the ISFTH. Um, we at the working group on telecardiology have the huge honor um, and privilege to um, uh, have this partnership with uh, our dear colleague Biliana and to uh, um, host and, and uh, uh, present the third Dr. Nanette Cass Wenger International Conference on Cardiovascular Disease in Women. Um, Biliana, please, you have the word. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you gathered uh, so much uh, VIPs in cardiology, so please take the word. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Michi. On behalf of uh, my fellowship program director, Professor Neshkovic, who is usually a very shy and humble person, so he doesn't, he lets the younger speak. Uh, I thank you for this partnership because enabled us to reach a global audience for an event that is happening for the third time this year in Belgrade. Sadly, due to COVID, we could not gather live here. We planned this session with Dr. Wenger in uh, December 2019 when she was in Belgrade and we designed it. And uh, with Dean Mitchell, who is uh, among my favorite deans, I cannot say that he's my the favorite dean because my current dean will be a and, but this dean has been my dean for a much, much longer time. And uh, so without uh, uh, further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Ray Mitchell, who is professor of medicine and pediatrics, uh, someone who puts a uh, Santa Claus on Friday and adds pillows so that his uh, his patients enjoy Christmas even as this testy times. Uh, besides being Dean of the Emeritus of the School of Medicine at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., he's also director of the W. Proctor Harvey Center for Excellence in Clinical Teaching. And we sincerely hope at, uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Belgrade, of, of uh, bringing that collaboration even further in, uh, and as we have discussed already in the past. So uh, without further ado, I will give you Dean Mitchell. And, but before that, I would like to thank Dr. Nanette Kaswanger, our global Shiro and guru for, for being with us today and for finding the time in a busy holiday season to spend an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, some of our panelists will join us later, so I will use the rest of the panel to whom I am deeply indebted to all for making us, helping us actually build a program that the, not just this country, but the region needs. So without further ado, Dr. Mitchell, live from Washington, DC. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Parafid. Uh, I'm, I'm an imposter for several reasons. One is I'm a rheumatologist, um, but I humbly um, uh, am able to add my welcome to the third annual Nanette Wanger World Symposium on Women's Health and Heart Disease. Um, thank you, Dr. Wanger, for your leadership and inspiration for these young people. I understand this ongoing process to your credit is due to the incessant efforts of Biana Parapid, Martha Gulati, Annabelle Vogan, among some other co-collaborators who have pushed this, um, um, and instrumental leadership here at Belgrade School of Medicine. With the guidance of mentors, women leaders, sheroes, hopefully an equally impressive number of he for she's, on this panel and otherwise, uh, I believe that also includes uh, Belgrade's cardiology division chief, Alexandra Neskovich, also a student of Professor Teofileski Parapid and mentor to the junior Dr. Parapid. I'm so honored and indeed intimidated to appear on this august panel. This is especially poignant because of the Belgrade School of Medicine's 100th anniversary. Uh, and uh, Professor Lalek, uh, we do send our congratulations to uh, Dean Nabosha Lalek um, for the 100 years of this wonderful school. And we will celebrate that going forward. And we will call on at least uh, a number of the incredible women faculty of your school as we proceed today. 
I was invited by Biana to talk about leadership in national programs. Uh, I'll share this with you in the context of your wonderful efforts, but also a well-known paradigm by Professor John Cotter from the Harvard Business School, uh, providing leadership's role in transformational change in any organization. Uh, I don't have to tell this group that more women die from heart attacks than from breast cancer. I must admit, I'm even more surprised that women, more women die from heart disease than all cancers combined. So if you will, and you will understand my reason for making this point, this is truly urgent if we are to impact women suffering from heart disease. As John Cotter reminds us, if we are to make transformative change, we must first and foremost create a sense of urgency. Uh, that must start the change of the transformative change. If, if this sounds like old news to you, it's probably because of those efforts of Go Red for Women, uh, the movement launched formally, I think in 2004 by the American Heart Association and created that urgency at the time, I believe was Nancy Brown, the CEO of that organization. I understand, however, these inaugural efforts may go back to the early 90s. Uh, in 2004, it was Dr. Daisy Lazarus, cardiology at Georgetown, who invited me to bring the efforts of our school to sign on to this project. I'm pleased that we were at least one of the first schools to do that. Um, it's also appropriate that selfishly, Dr. Theopolowski Parapid and Dr. Parapid had already served as adjunct faculty at Georgetown, including nomination of that senior member for the coveted Golden Apple Teaching Award. They came each year and taught gross anatomy, met with our faculty, and then came back to Belgrade to teach for the full year there. Liliana shared an anecdote with me from one of her Georgetown mentors, Dr. Cynthia Tracy, chief of electrophysiology, and at the time, the W. Proctor Harvey Professor of Medicine. She also introduced her to the kind and gentle Proctor Harvey during that visit. Dr. Parapid was a resident at the time, also working with her mom to translate Harrison's Principles of Medicine to Serbian uh, to complete the English uh, curriculum changes which were going on at Belgrade and it continued. Uh, during the recent years of your illustrious hi history. Dr. Tracy, however, mentored her like one of her fellows. What is your five-year plan, she said, and it was then that it became her five-year plan to complete her cardiology fellowship um, at, cardi at Cardiology et Maladie Vasculaire in Paris, forgive my French, Alex, uh, followed by her PhD in cardiology at Belgrade. Uh, I must share another anecdote in this mentoring process of another female cardiologist mentored by Dr. Harvey. Caridad Platinia de la Uz was a wonderful Cuban-American student. She completed a master's in cardiac physiology at Hopkins. She became fascinated there with the story of Mary Ellen Avery, pioneer of pediatric cardiology. She even took clippings from Dr. Avery's Night Blooming Sirius in her office uh, that had never bloomed since Dr. Avery left the office. She took them to her little kitchen and planted them. Um, now, because of her background, someone encouraged her shortly after her arrival at Georgetown to reach out to Dr. Harvey, which she did. He was working on his textbook in cardiac auscultation. He welcomed her, and like Dr. Tracy, he asked about her five-year plan. Now, Carrie did not hesitate. She dreamed of being a pediatric cardiologist. Dr. Harvey encouraged her, as Dr. Avery was one of his best friends. If you do pediatric cardiology, you must either go to Boston Children's or Texas Heart, and I am determined to help you get there. Uh, so Caridad got into medical school. She matched at Boston Children's for Pediatrics, and in her second year, 
was applying for fellowship. Now do the math. That's six years since she had the conversation with Dr. Harvey. Uh, she did get an invitation to interview at Texas Children's. She walked in that day and on the wall was a portrait of Mary Ellen Avery. So she knew this was a good omen. She walked in, she had a great interview. The program director opened the file at the end of the interview, pulled out a handwritten letter from Proctor Harvey and said, do you know how powerful this letter is? Um, so uh, Caridad goes home, gets to her little apartment, gets a phone call from Texas that was very promising and indeed offered her a fellowship, walked into her kitchen and the night blooming Sirius was blooming. Uh, if you know that plant, it only blooms at night. Mary Ellen Avery would stay in her office all night when it bloomed. So it was a couple of months later, she came by, I met with her, heard her success, and we shared our sadness that Dr. Harvey had died. As she turned to walk out, she stopped and said, what day did he die? And I said, September 28th. And she said, that was the day the night blooming Sirius bloomed. So what's, what's my point? My point is that there are those women. She has joined your ranks. She continues mentoring women and men in pediatric cardiology. She's working at Texas, but stays active. Um, what should we do going forward? We need to take on this charge. I, I will um, assure you, Liliana Parapet, as you know, uh, Caridad de la Uz, as you know, they are working hard. It is heart disease as the leading cause of death in the US, pre almost 300,000 deaths due to heart disease prior to COVID or about one in five of all female deaths. Um, as you know, it's the leading cause of death for African-American, Caucasian, American Indian, and Alaska Native women. But interestingly, about one in 16 women have coronary artery disease after age 20. Um, so what do we see in symptomatic we women? I'm not trying to lecture this group, but is it the irregular heartbeat, the atypical chest pain, the very atypical diagnostic cardiac symptoms? What can we do? We must work on the suspicion and the gender bias that's inherent in us, sometimes unknown. Uh, we need to have the right level of suspicion to do the right test. Uh, and for many published studies, it is the female patient who's approached differently for the same symptoms that their male colleagues have. We're also warned by a colleague at Stanford, Atul Boot, that we collect terabytes of data. We collect but more data every day, certainly in our country, on the electronic medical record that we never use. We have uh, tremendous numbers of millions of covered lives that we never track their data. Uh, it is our ability and our responsibility to collect, respond, and use that data to direct our work, to direct your work, to look at outcomes, to begin to measure our success, to embed the changes that we need to reduce the inequity in women's care. Good data can not only change diagnosis, but for some of them, some of the folks on this call, it will potentially change reimbursement. It will change the ability to get procedures authorized uh, for our women patients, and importantly, it'll allow us to measure better outcomes. Um, how do we know? Are we making progress? Are we moving forward? So clearly, to remedy this long-standing problem, we need to create that sense of compelling urgency. Uh, it will take champions like members of the Nanette Wenger panel to raise the sense of urgency of this problem. We must keep the commitment at the highest level of senior leadership, not only the American Heart, the American College, but similar school champions and organizations across the global cardiology community. 
we have to sustain the message. We can celebrate early wins, but we do need to be creating data, generating the ongoing data and measuring that success. Uh, this is, uh, thank you, Alex, for your help, but I'd like to share just a few slides, not many, uh, a very small handful uh, to give you a little better feeling of uh, John Cotter's thoughts about this. Um, pardon me just a moment and I will share my screen if I'm successful. Take your time. Can you see it? Not yeah. yet, but I'm, we're sure it's coming. <laughs> okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's try one more time. Okay, it's coming, okay, save, okay, continue. Sorry, the techno peasant again. Don't worry. So just try to click on the, on the uh, green button, share screen. Okay, let's try this. And then we're going to do, thank you, Alex. Great, we can see if you can go on full screen. Okay, terrific. So what did Cotter, Cotter proposed these eight stages of transformative change. Um, and what we learned from that is that applies no matter what the, what the institution that you're trying to change. But what he also discovered is that if you don't follow certain steps you make some progress and then it fizzles out. So how do we apply those principles to women's cardiology care truly across the global academic health system? Clearly, as we know from this incredible panel here today, they're national, they're international cardiology societies and you all are leaders of incredible organizations around here. Um, it's also the individuals on this panel. Uh, you're absolutely dedicated. You are mentoring, you are teaching, you are teaching your colleagues, you're reminding them uh, sometimes a little firmly that they really missed this uh, big clue and this was a woman who needed different care or this was a woman who needed our, our suspicion to order those tests. It's important, but I would also just commend you that this group has tremendous, tremendous opportunity to bring those powers together. Um, it's clear that as we've talked about, uh, we know the outcomes. The outcomes are benchmarked for cardiology around the world, but we must benchmark them also by gender uh, and create that urgency. For each of us, it's a cross mission and that means across our cardiology divisions or departments in each institution, but it also says that we keep it at a high level at the chairs, at the chief medical officer levels, at the outcomes, at quality improvement. How are we improving our care across our hospitals and each individual? We can't become complacent. Uh, the leadership of the of the coalition. I'm sorry, folks, I, you, you have already formed this incredible coalition and now you can't step back. Uh, you can't become complacent. You've got to use the power of this. It brings you an incredibly high level of leadership and vision that doesn't stop at one department. It doesn't stop at one division of cardiology. It's global. It's so impressive to look at the individuals around this table. Uh, should there be a more formal international council of chairs or chiefs to bring this forward and to help us with the messaging? So an individual, one thing about data, and remember that a tool boot uh, initially was at the University of California. And as he said, they happened to use um, Epic as a medical record, he could use de-identified data and track 15 million covered lives throughout the University of California system. If you ask questions on a database that large, 
the answers surprise us. Um, can we generate the data? The data is there. We use Cerner, and again, throughout the US, tremendous number of covered lives that we can generate data, answer questions. We do need to celebrate those early wins so we can sustain this. And I, I can't overemphasize the fact that it should be embedded in our culture. If there's no consequences to missing those diagnoses, then behavior won't change. So we do need to drive our outcomes and reward those where we're able to sustain it. Uh, let me, uh, I think John Cotter would be pleased with what you've done. Um, this is, I'll leave you with this, and there is um, his particular um, institution. He now has his own website. But if you look at these, this big circle of creating the urgency, building the coalition, you guys read this before I even delivered the talk. Uh, you're forming a strategic vision for this initiative. And yes, you have enlisted a volunteer army, but importantly, it, it is embedded in this effort. Uh, there are barriers still to your efforts that need to be removed. Um, you can generate short-term wins and you can celebrate those, but you need to go beyond that. It needs to be a sustain, sustained effort before we can institute the change that will really transform the way we provide women's health care in this country. Uh, thank you for your patience with me. Uh, I am so grateful to get this chance um, to talk with you. I, um, Liliana, I'm happy to answer questions or participate in the discussion as it comes up along the way for efficiency of our time. Thank you so much. I thought I was unmuted. Uh, I was muted. Thank you so much. Actually, with the era that we're living, uh, when we were planning this a year ago, we didn't know that we would be having COVID, that we will be handling also long-term consequences of COVID, and that kids, sadly, although wrongly identified first as the protected and uh, are actually our super spreaders, uh, and uh, actually the the role of a pediatric rheumatologist <laughs> turned out to be something that no one would have thought that we would like to have as a, a key person on the panel to ask all the questions we don't know answers to. And I think we are all yet to discover. And, uh, but it, even with that, without that, the position of a pediatrician in general is important in all our endeavors to provide primordial preventions to, to women worldwide, because as we all know, women are the carriers of the health of a family. It's the women who usually do the providing, who do the cooking. It's, it, it's that's worldwide. the culture that we entire, besides our mitochondrial DNA. <laughs> so so uh, there is also the, the, our phenotype is actually, besides our genotype, very heavily influenced by, my, by our mothers. Remember that it was uh, Malala's famous quote when she got the Nobel Peace Prize, give a girl a pencil, you'll change the world. The world, absolutely, because the future is female. So there are plenty of the panelists here who have multiple daughters. We won't emphasize them, but they know who they are and what they cope with with us uh, rebelous all, kids at home. You all also, though, see our my adult lupus patients and the female lupus patients who have cardiac disease, disproportionate. Is it all, is it all vasculitis? No, it's, it's uh, cardiac disease. It is, is it because we don't treat their hypertension? We're not sure, but clearly they have premature cardiac disease and, and autoimmune disease is, is a big problem. So I just commend you for the work you're doing. Uh, there is work ahead. But uh, it's of course. It's, why? Why else would you all be here? <laughs> thank you. We, thank you so much. So, without further ado, uh, Dr. Wenger, thank you for bearing us with us for this minor discussion between the two talks. I uh, leave you the floor. I know you don't have slides, but your lectures are usually breathtaking. So, as uh, Dean Mitchell, so uh, I'll zip it up and unmute myself, Dr. Wenger. 
first place, let me say hello from Atlanta and from the Emory University School of Medicine and join my colleagues in welcoming you to the third annual uh, Wenger International Conference on Cardiovascular Disease in Women. Let me also wish everyone happy holidays and a very happy and healthy new year and hope that next year in a COVID free world, we will meet in person in Belgrade. Our conversation is entitled The Importance of Leadership in Equitable Healthcare for Women. And at risk of repeating some of the excellent presentation just made, I want to emphasize that despite the major advances in cardiovascular prevention and diagnosis and therapy for women in the past decades, cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of morbidity and mortality for women. And what I will do in this presentation is to cite what I know best, and that is the database from the US. And I hope that it will be augmented from representatives of other nations in our discussion. The first issue that I want to address is a major problem and really a call to action. And it is based on the American Heart Association's recent publication, 10 year difference in women's awareness of cardiovascular disease as their leading cause of death. You know, a decade ago in 2009, as a result of the National Institute of Health's Heart Truth Campaign and AHA's Go Red for Women and the efforts of Women Heart, those campaigns increased women's awareness to 65%. But what are the data today? in 2019, the awareness has dropped to 44%, from 65 to 44%. And the decreased awareness is particularly prominent among Hispanic and Black women and among the younger women. And what we've done is we've lost a decade. And during this decade, there has been an increase in cardiovascular mortality among young women and it has erased the advances of several decades specifically for the young women and particularly for those in minority populations. Now, what is our action? It is education and culturally appropriate information for awareness, awareness of cardiovascular risk factors and particularly the signs and symptoms of myocardial infarction. And this has to be embraced by community organizations. So this is public education. But there is a second part to this, and that is professional education. We must see that all of the professional education curricula include sex as a biologic variable, that they address female specific issues, and that we advocate for cooperation with our OBGYN colleagues, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But when we talk about equitable health care for women, remember that equitable is not the same as equal. Equal implies sameness, and equitable really implies fairness, so that if there is equitable care and fairness, the result is comparable, favorable outcomes. And that is not always achieved by equal, same care for women and for men. And what we must highlight are the issues specific to women for prevention, for diagnosis, and for therapy. We have to escalate education and awareness. And one of the better ways to do it is cardiovascular screening and counseling including screening of younger populations of women. Now COVID has exposed for us the social determinants of health and it has called attention 
to the vulnerable populations. And therefore, one of the things that we must do in our education is to have specific focus on the vulnerable populations. Now let's talk for a moment about women in cardiology and women as leaders. Certainly, I'm not trying to undermine the value of our male colleagues, uh, many of whom are present in this session. But the underrepresentation of women in cardiology deprives the nation of a sizable clinical and re research resource and talent pool. And what we have to do not only is to increase the representation of women, but to advance women in their biomedical careers so that we can have and reach their full potential in contributing to the national pool of information. Now, what we see in the US, and I think it is not sold to our nation, is that there's a leaky pipeline of US women in medicine. Today, more than 50% of our internal medicine residents are women. 21% though are cardiology fellows, 17% are cardiology faculty. And if we look at one particular area, the composition of our journal editorial boards, maybe 12 to 15%. And this is where the leading area of information is. The same is the case with clinical trial leadership. Let's focus in on the cardiovascular clinical trials. More than half had no female leadership. And when we look at the publication of the clinical trials, only one in 10 of the cardiovascular clinical trials had women as the first or last author in the clinical trial population. And let me advance the concept that the lack of inclusiveness of women in academic medicine and in clinical trials has augmented the underrepresentation of women participants in these trials. Women leading the trial will pose efforts to include women as trial participants and often are very effective in enrolling women in the trials. But going back to women in academia, certainly not only are they underrepresented in trials and in journal editors, but there are fewer full professors in our academic institution. There are fewer division and department chairs and there are fewer deans. But there is some light at the end of the tunnel. And what we've begun to see in the past decade is diversity in national and international societies and meetings. We see emerging, emerging women leaders in the cardiovascular professional societies. And so many of them in the last several years have had women in leaders. And of course, this is promise. These are role models for the younger women. We also see the emphasis on women as participants in panels in national and international meetings. And importantly, at a local level, are the women in cardiology groups. And I see so many of my academic daughters worldwide in these women in cardiology groups where they are learning advocacy skills where they are honing their leadership skills. This is the promise for the future. Let me return to the issue of cooperation with our OBGYN colleagues. And this is really part of inclusiveness. What we've learned in recent years is that cardiovascular health levels in the US are significantly lower in pregnant compared with non-pregnant women. And these are women, obviously, in the 20 to 44-year-old group. And I would suggest that this lessening of cardiovascular health may be an important contribution to the adverse outcomes of pregnancy, potentially to the stunning increase in the occurrence of preeclampsia. And what the publications tell us 
is that fewer than one in 10 pregnant women per the AHA's Life Simple 7 have high cardiovascular health. So nine of 10 pregnant women do not have optimal cardiovascular health. And here is where we must join with our OBGYN colleagues. Remember the OBGYNs are in the preventive mode, pap smears, mammograms. Now they have to focus as well on cardiovascular prevention as a leading cause of morbidity and mortality for women. Let me come back just for a moment to the COVID epidemic and how that has impacted women in the cardiovascular science. Actually, the major adverse impact has been on the women with children because in addition to their clinical and research responsibilities, they have become the major implementers of childcare, of education. They've essentially become playground monitors for the physical health of their children. And obviously this multitasking has impeded their careers and we need almost a global approach to say, how do we permit catch up in terms of research accomplishments, in terms of academic events. Now, let me address a parallel topic, and that is the issue of legislation. And I want to cite as an example, the 2015 Research for All Act uh, passed by the US Congress, which shows that despite what the world has seen in recent years, the Congress can act jointly and can do something very, very useful. You know, previously, uh, research involved recommendations and guidelines to the NIH and to the FDA. And as you know, when there is a recommendation or a guideline, people can adopt it or ignore it, depending on the culture of that setting. But when there is a legislation, this is now a mandate. And 2015 was a mandate to the NIH and to the FDA. In the NIH, in the basic research sphere, the investigators were mandated to identify the sex of cells, tissues, and animals. I think most of us were shocked that many of our basic science colleagues had no idea of the provenance of their cells and tissues, whether they came from male or female animals, and yet they were studying female problems in these cells and tissues. In terms of clinical research, it was mandated to include women and minorities in NIH funded clinical research. And those of us who have put in research grants know that is not enough to simply say, I am going to include women and analyze them, but there must be a detailed plan to ensure adequate representation and how this is incorporated in the research plan. This is groundbreaking. The FDA was mandated to report separately the risks and benefits of the novel pharmacotherapies and devices for women and for men. But that was just the beginning. And last month, we had from our FDA guidance for industry. And I want to emphasize that term guidance, because that means this is only the first baby step on that journey. The guidance to industry was to include representative populations, but there was no enforcement. So this is back where we were before the 2015 Act, and I expect that many of us are going to emphasize to the FDA that they must do as they did with the COVID vaccines and go warp speed in terms of the inclusion of women and minorities by industry. Now, the challenge to the clinical and research communities, I think I've said this in many other settings, is essentially a four-step process. Investigate the basic research, educate the community and the healthcare community, advocate as has been done by so many professional organizations 
and when necessary, legislate. So it is investigate, educate, advocate, and legislate. The challenge then that I offer to my colleagues in the cardiovascular community worldwide is to increase diversity, to increase inclusiveness, because this is the pathway to justice, to equitable cardiovascular care for women and to equitable cardiovascular leadership for women. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. We didn't unmute ourselves, but I think our, our applause was uh, visible at least. I, uh, before we move to the, to the, we're well on time and we're not pushing any deadlines here, but uh, before we switch to, to the panel discussion, be it where I would just like to thank all who have been helping so far who are on and off the panel today and uh, our system important factors around here. I would like to give the floor to Professor Gaita from uh, neighboring Romania, an important partner who is going to share with us some uh, VIP news from ESC, apparently that uh, haven't been shared elsewhere. So consider yourselves very privileged. I know I am because your phone call this morning was very touching. And uh, without further ado, I think uh, your video, Alex, you will be playing it, I assume. Yes, as soon as Professor Gaito gives me. Okay. Grace. Thank you so much, Professor, again. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Biliana. Distinguished guests, I'm deeply honored and extremely happy to be here with you. So I'm I'm privileged, I'm blessed to be to be a, a minority today, to be a men minority in the, in this debate. Because uh, and and I saw a lot of wonderful uh, personalities. Uh, I, I want to say hello to academician Kanyu, to, to Professor Lalic, to distinguished guests from, from the United States, uh, and uh, of course to the one and only Professor Nanette Wenger. And I, I, I had the privilege due to my very close friend, in fact, my best friend, uh, Professor Lawrence Perling from Emory, to, to meet in person Professor Wenger. And also last, last summer in that amazing escape organized course to be there. So uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to share all these ideas also in Romania because we built in Romania a Romanian Heart Foundation and we are in line with um, uh, all the campaigns connected with uh, Red Heart for Women and I know all that, all that wonderful idea. So please allow me to, to, to share with you um, a new campaign, uh, a short, very short movie uh, produced by uh, European Society of Cardiology. And this was launched only last Friday during ESC board. So we have a campaign in entire, uh, not only Europe because ESC consisted of 57 countries. And uh, it's not only based on the fact that we have to fight against the pandemic and also to keep uh, as, low the cardiovascular risk, but also in this movie is, uh, you can see the committed and uh, dedicated women taking care of their patient. Please, Alex, put if it's possible the movie. Right away, just bear with me a little bit, sorry, yeah. Ale Aliepo Biliana, wonderful organizing meeting. Thank you so much, Alex. You're forgiven. It was your birthday yesterday, so uh, you're completely and on your you're on your vacation, and there is no better he for she advocacy than a colleague taking time from his vacation to support uh, support support the joint project. It's a pleasure, Biliana. Always a pleasure. So here goes.
COVID-19. It killed more than 1.6 million people in 2020. But heart attacks kill more than 7 million people each and every year. Yet many people still do not know the most common symptoms. A heart attack is typically a burning, tightening pressure in the chest. It can radiate to the arms and neck. Sometimes it may just be an unusual shortness of breath, but it's almost never a sharp or stabbing pain. And symptoms can come and go days before the full-blown heart attack. Getting medical help quickly can save your life. Every minute counts and hospitals are set up to care for you safely during the pandemic. It's up to you. Never ignore the signs from your heart. You can't pause a heart. Thank you so much. We have tried to start trending that hashtag already a couple of hours ago when ESC reached out to uh, the usual SOMI suspects of, uh, of prevention. And I think Mama has also uh, tweeted something and uh, tagged us all and I, I support it, of course, so although we were in the middle of our event. So um, without further ado, we have two panelists who are yet to join us in the next 10 minutes. But I would like to start first with uh, thanking all of you being able to join us today. It's the end of the year. We're in, middle in the middle of holidays. Hanukkah just ended. Christmas is around the corner. Orthodox Christmas is around the next corner on January 6th, when apparently a curfew, global curfew, partly in Europe will end. But still, we are, um, we are all the testy times in all our centers worldwide. And uh, whether it's a... Uh, vaccine crisis like at Stanford, the Dr. Harrington is currently solving again where, where their leadership and I don't, I don't see a better example of leadership but giving up your spot on the vaccine row for a technical error for, for your frontline uh, uh, fellows and residents to have it than that. Uh, but I would like to start first with, um, with my uh, five key supporters from back in 2018. And that is Dr. Annabel Volgman from uh, Rush in Chicago, who is, besides being my co counselor for, for ACC WIC Leadership Council, she is also the AHA WIC uh, chair. And uh, that the event that we held back then was fortunately supported. It was a bipartisan effort of AHA and ACC, actually, in 20, 2018, for which I'm especially proud. Uh, then uh, Dr. Martha Gulati, who, who is uh, our globe-trotting Canadian, uh, currently, currently in Arizona and a big sister of mine. I ended up having a big sister just because I picked up someone it was felt love at first sight that morning at Belgrade's Nikola Tesla Airport. And last, but everything but the least, are Dr. Sandra Lewis from Portland, Oregon, who is uh, one who founded uh, the WIC section within the e ACC and is currently uh, the PAC chair. And not just that, she's going to share us a bit later about the mid career uh, Sandra Lewis Leadership Institute for the ACC, for which she, she provided budget. And she will sponsor, apparently, uh, plenty of uh, mid-career women. And uh, I take special pride of being her baby project also, a three-year-old baby project now <laughs> since 2017. And with that, I would like also to give a big shout out for my two local mentors since I was in medical school. And that is Professor Miroslava Goinich, whom we lost somewhere on the screen, but she's going to be back. She's the head of, uh, uh, we called it pathology of pregnancy department within our medical school's maternity and uh, the person who almost made me go into gynecology and obstetrics. Uh, but still, I remained in the field that I, I always loved, and that was the overlap between, between the two. And the last but not the least of the, um, of the five key note speakers in 2018, Professor Katarina Lalic, uh, who is a diabetologist by training. And as I love to say besides the fact that she is an amazing mentor and sponsor 
she is also a fearless she for she our medical school is very privileged to have and her only drawback is that uh, people occasionally make the mistake of announcing her as uh, uh, the wife of our dean uh, jocelyn alumnus also and uh, also a famous diabetologist and uh, but i have to admit i was more math mentored by by professor lalic as a uh, Dr. Wenger has this amazing uh, story, how she used to be introduced at, at, at Atlanta and said, good morning, Dr. Wenger, sir. Good morning, Dr. Wenger, ma'am. So I was more mentored by good morning, <laughs> Dr. Lalich, ma'am, than Dr. Lalich, sir. Uh, with that, I would also like to thank Professor Kanyu, who um, is a globally well-known cardiopathologist trained in the United States and France and a mentor to all of us uh, for, for decades now because currently, besides being president of the National Atherosclerosis Society, he is running successfully for a couple of decades the Board for Cardiovascular Pathology that really endeavors to bring all of us working to diminish these sorry figures in Serbia and the region uh, linked to coronary and cerebrovascular disease. So uh, I know that Professor Kanyu was sweet enough uh, not to take time on, on the panel by talking, but I would like to, to invite, I will just wave to Dr. Waxman who just connected. Thank you so much, Dr. Waxman, for, for we know we, you were busy in your cath lab. So uh, Georgetown Hoya thanks you tremendously. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I would just like to offer some space to doctors uh, Wolman Galati and, and Lewis to share a couple of their thoughts on where we are so far and if uh, if there are any places or improvement or how, how you see our 2021 conference, actually. We plan to hold it in Belgrade, but we plan to diversify it a bit. So maybe you can think about that and I'll introduce the rest of the panel. My, my, other, my personal shiro, uh, Dr. Noral Belly mertz who was sweet enough to host me some years ago by, by uh, she knew me from meetings, but it was Annabelle Volman and Angela Mas who sadly couldn't be with us today. And uh, so that's how I, I saw the Women Heart Center that was always uh, the one that we, when we say Women Heart Center, I think the majority of the people first think Barbara Strayson Women Heart Center at Cedar sinai LA. And uh, Dr. Noel Barry Mertz, besides being a, a, a scientific character we all admire because she gives, she, she has proven with all the trials we have read so far from wise all the way to warrior that we're, having ongoing right now that women deserve a chance even when they have um, you know, cause, you know, cause in all different okas that people sometimes deny as, uh, as a cause of ischemia. So Dr. Barry Mertz, I won't make you talk about anything you don't feel like addressing towards the end. I will just continue introducing the panel, but please feel free to, to unmute yourself uh, wh wh whichever moment you find most appropriate. I will go back to Dr. Rachel Bond from Gilbert Arizona, who is uh, who is also a New York girl who moved to the South and uh, who is actually a force of nature of Dignity Health. With whom just a month ago we had a, an amazing conference on on women's health, also that was covering different aspects. And I'm I am so happy to have you today among us. Not just because we work together on on reducing maternal mortality for. Uh, black mothers in the United States within the task force where I was invited generously by the ABC. But I look forward to, to our furthering our collaborations be, and in the years to come. And last but not the least. Hello, Donna. Um, I'd like you to say um, at this time, since you just introduced Rachel, that um, I wanted to thank Dr. Mitchell for his comments about celebrating small victories. Um, and I think that we, we should celebrate the victory that um, since 2014, there has been a decrease in maternal mortality. And it may be because of all the attention that's been given to it. And I wonder if um, there, maybe we can make some comments about that. And I know that uh, Noel was the one who taught me that safe PCI really made a huge difference in radial access for women and cath uh, catheterizations. I think these small victories do need to be celebrated. And um, 
the ACC CVD and Women Committee has been writing papers on um, the progress that's been made and the problems that are still current. But I think we need to emphasize the progress that has been made in improving cardiovascular disease in women. Do you want to develop that or do you want me to finish wrapping up presenting the panel and discussing? Well, I later? wonder if Rachel can just um, make a comment on whether that is the case for maternal mortality and whether she is still seeing that um, progress. Uh, Dr. Parapid, what would you like me to do? Would you like me to wait until you finish <laughs> introducing the panel Go or would ahead. you like me to weigh in? Please. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. So thank you, Dr. Volgman. Um, so one thing I can say, I'm one, thank you so much, Dr. Parapid, for the honor to be on this panel um, amongst amazing um, women and men in the fields that are just span all the fields that we collaborate with. Um, as Dr. Volgman said, we've made, I think, large strides when it comes to women's cardiovascular disease. One thing that is important for me and a lot of the work that I'm doing, even with the Association of Black Cardiology, is looking at the actual racial and ethnic makeup when we're looking at these strides. And although there may be improvement, we know that the numbers are still very daunting when it comes to African-Americans, non-Hispanics, um, as well as Native, the Native American community. But when we really look at the actual racial and ethnic makeup, it's primarily African-American women where we're not seeing the same decline in rate, particularly for maternal mortality. So we were very privileged to have the opportunity with the Association of Black Cardiologists to have a task force where we invited not just clinicians, but also community leaders, a lot of which were black led community leaders. And we really want to, as Dr. Na uh, Dr. Wenger mentioned, we wanna make sure that we provide leadership, not just for women, but also diverse groups of uh, women. And I, I think I'm honored to be part of an organization that works very closely with the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, like ABC, the Association of Black Cardiologists, where we are allowing people of diverse makeups to have leadership roles and take a stand when it comes to these disparities that we're seeing. Um, we had our task force, we work collaboratively together to create solutions. And our hope is that these solutions will be able to be shared amongst other scientific societies so that way we can learn from them and focus in on more research efforts. So again, although we're seeing improvements, when we really break it up from a race and ethnic perspective, we're seeing that it's not across the board. And those are the patient populations that we really need to amplify and highlight to improve quality of care. Thank you so much, Dr. Bond. I would just take an opportunity first, since Dr. Mamas Mamas was with us from the beginning to switch now, I think we finished. Oh, sorry, no, my sister Mervat, so sorry. I was trying to finish with, I was looking at the screen left and right like this. So Dr. Mervat Alasnag, the first international, international cardiologist of the MENA region and uh, my, my partner in all my international week crimes, I proudly call my sister that Twitter brought to my life. So. That's one of the silver linings of this pandemic. We have learned to use more technologies than we used to before. And that's that's how we actually got even together here today. So Dr. Alice Nag, I, I, I'll let you share your, your wisdom pearls a bit later. Let me just finish introducing the panel. So Dr. Mamas Mamas, my apologies, my friends for for, but you're my Greek compatriot. So you you forgive me every time I, I, I uh, eat carrots, right? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much for your your fearless he for she advocacy for all of you and I also met on Twitter and uh, we have built a very nice collaboration so far because you've been an amazing mentor and a sponsor so far and I'm counting on you for all our endeavors in the future cardio obstetrics and others. And finally, let me go back to Washington DC with Dr. Ron Waxman who's been an amazing leader himself for over a decade now. We met many, many years ago. I was just a fellow in Paris who came to, to Washington for CRT with the idea of her then time boss that maybe we could jointly do an event because we used to have a live event for, for 
uh, in Belgrade every April, as Professor Kanyu remembers. And uh, we wanted actually to partner our cath labs. Maybe we will actually do something similar for the next Nanette Kasswinger uh, conference next year. So you can live stream all women uh, I see from Washington Hospital Centers and uh, do a case that we will gladly come. And Dr. Waxman, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm sorry we're not in Belgrade, but in 2021, we're going to say not next year in Jerusalem, we're going to say next year in Belgrade this time. So uh, happy new year. We exchanged Hanukkah greetings last week, but love to see you live. I, I, I thank you so much. And I invite you to comment later on how actually you make your center and your program and your conferences being very he for she friendly and very uh, open for all women without any bias, no matter where they come from, as long as they're competent in what they do. And finally, Dr. Harrington, we, we are so happy to see you here for all those who don't happen not to know Dr. Harrington, besides being an amazing chair of medicine who Friday gave up his own vaccine spot for someone else and uh, is currently solving a huge uh, uh, COVID crisis back home. Uh, he found time for, for all of us today and uh, has been also selflessly mentoring all of us worldwide. He met through meetings and uh, we go all the way back from, I don't know, 2008, 2009. He was the one who basically took me by the hand and introduced me to Dr. Wenger some seven, eight years ago. And uh, because I was too shy to come up and say hello. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Harrington, besides being immediate past president of the AHA, is someone who also supported the, the first, uh, as I said, be partisan effort of building this conference as a both supported by AHA and ACC back in 2018. So before you give us your own uh, leadership tips and tricks for, for supporting uh, equitable both care and the career advancement, I would just like to take, like to take a moment and acknowledge uh, my local supports. You know, uh, you in the United States, you all choose whether you're going to vote Democrat or Republican, we don't have a, live in a bipartisan world, we live in a multi-partisan world. So if you throw an event and people who are sitting on three different ministries from three different political parties reach out independently to you to offer support, that means that you probably are doing something good. No matter how much of the audience you you draw at the first event as, as uh, both doctors, uh, Gulati, Volgman, San, uh, uh, Lewis, and my, my local cohorts remembered then. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge the same way our Ministry of Health that has been supporting the launch of the center that will finally happen somewhere ne next year when we not just finish the building, but manage to finally uh, solve the issue of, of the rising COVID uh, figures around here but also uh, the office uh, that was in charge of improving and in, in implementing the UN agenda, the SDG agenda of 2030. Finally, uh, the uh, uh, East West Bridge International Think Tank to which I, I belong for the past six years. And uh, they, be they believe that um, we fortunately uh, in this region have to uh, have to believe also in the power of global diplomacy for the benefit of our own region, not just our own country. And uh, besides that, I would like also to, uh, besides my own clinical center and our medical school that celebrates 100 years this, this December, to uh, applaud also uh, a detrimental support of the uh, National Medical Licensing Committee, their, their uh, CEO welcomed our guests in 2018 and they're supporting our agenda of both uh, achievement of equity and providing of adequate right support for all our, for all our doctors currently engaged frontline. And three family run businesses, because if you want to take good care of a family like you do when you take care of women's health, you, uh, we were fortunately recognized by three family businesses that uh, so far supported uh, modestly, but importantly, the uh, Go Red initiative in, in in Serbia, and that is Vizim, whose who uh, whose headline you see up there. It's actually the private primary healthcare physician system that 
is functioning across the country. It started in Belgrade when I was just a medical student. It is still a family-run business, and they still help me, give me space and stuff for all my pro bono exams. I would like to acknowledge also Informatica AD, uh, a company that's been existing for over three decades in this market, and uh, they've been uh, they brought Microsoft to this corner of the world. And uh, besides that, I we did. Between the two waves, we managed to do the first round of, of exams for all the women employed in their system through June and July. And, and of course, we didn't discriminate men. So I also saw guys who wanted to see another doctor who's not just their regular doctor. And finally, my my dear friend who is in a, who was a startup uh, fashion designer only three years ago uh, and who designed with me the ponchos that you girls brought back home and took back for Dr. Wenger that she proudly wore to a, to a next uh, Go Red event, which, and she fortunately today has a thriving business that is still supporting us and will be designing all our, all our red apparel. So without further ado, let's just bring the roll backwards. So mamas, Yes. What are your thoughts? Whatever you, whatever you feel like sharing with us, please do. I mean, I guess you know it, it's interesting in the United Kingdom as well. We see great disparities um, in women's cardiovascular care. I mean, we've published a load of work around this, both in terms of access to cath labs following an acute coronary syndrome. So women with high grace risk score are two times less likely to be offered. Um, cardiac catheterization than men with a low risk score and even when they are they're three times less likely to have it within an appropriate guideline uh, recommended time we see that women are significantly less likely to get radial access even in the healthcare system where radial access accounts for 90 percent of cases and when um, women are treated um, for their acute coronary syndrome they're less likely to get um, potent antiplatelet therapy, um, so Presquil and Ticagrelor. So, you know, it's, it's a real problem. And I, it's interesting to see, you know, how we can action this because you know, certainly the guidelines advocate um, best practice, but we're just not implementing guidelines. And it'll be interesting to hear other societal leaders and leaders in this space as to how best to achieve this implementation, where I think the most problem is the evidence is there, it's just the implementation. Thank you so much. So I won't be the uh, headmistress who calls names when uh, kids don't want to answer questions. So <laughs> whoever feels like uh, Martha, I see you unmuted. Dr. Galati. Yeah, Shauna, I just wanted to congratulate you. You know, three years ago, we had the opportunity to be in your country and watch what you were growing and creating in an environment that's not that easy. And we learned a lot about Serbia and the differences and how women and heart diseases and even the difference in risk factors, a lot more smoking, a lot differences actually in cholesterol we saw from the national data there. And it just makes us know that there's, you know, with energy like yours, hope for the future. If we can keep doing this on an international level, that's how we're gonna affect change. And so I just wanted to thank you for your leadership and for making, bringing the attention in your country. You're really a leader. And um, I think, you know, with more initiatives and more of what you're giving an example of what you can do in your country, other people can do in their country. So um, congratulations on the third. And I would like to know your five-year plan with some time of how you're going to grow this even further, because it, you have great potential and great support as seen uh, as everyone on this, this uh, meeting. Thank you so much for all your wholehearted sisterly support always. You keep setting the bar higher and higher, but I know you, you got it from mom, I know. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. Dr. Harrington, we just wanna give you a big virtual hug for being with us today because we know that you're having a, a tough time there and uh, we're all rooting for you. Yeah, no, well, certainly uh, thank you for inviting me and it's a privilege to be part of this group and uh, to see a lot of uh, uh, good friends from around the globe on this. And 
yeah, Northern California, like Southern California, and uh, with uh, Dr. Barry Merrins is we're getting hit hard right now. And I just getting out of a series of things where we're uh, trying to mobilize more beds throughout the health, throughout, throughout our county healthcare system. But on specifically the issues of heart disease in women, I, I hope many of you saw a paper that the AHA put out earlier this year, uh, led by Mary Cushman, Vermont, which is a uh, scientific statement that looks at a, a survey that we've conducted every 10 years going back to 1990, looking at awareness of heart disease in women among women. And this was the first time over the decade that we've saw a decline in awareness of heart disease as a leading cause of death and disability amongst women. And what's particularly noted, notable is that that decline is mostly seen in women of a millennial age group. And so younger women are not recognizing, to Dr. Galati's point, the importance of lifetime uh, heart health management of cholesterol and weight and diabetes and cigarettes. And this is, this is a, a, a big issue. Um, we're gonna launch a series of projects this next year uh, through AHA in an attempt to, uh, to address some of this. It was quite striking. Uh, some of that will come through our Go Red for Women uh, baseline uh, platform. Some of that will come through other forms, much of which will be announced in uh, February during Heart Month, and in particular during some of the uh, Go Red for Women events. Um, the Go Red for Women events this year, while virtual, are going to be spectacular. And uh, I'll just encourage all of you, it'll be a mixture of uh, sort of social awareness, but also uh, a lot of emphasis on the science and the science gaps that we need to uh, address. So again, thanks for having me. Uh, the Heart Association is definitely in this for the long term, and uh, we want to be helpful. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to switch to Dr. Alice Nag, uh, just to, to switch continents before we go towards uh, Dr. Waxman, for instance. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick here. I'm just going to echo what pretty much everybody said, I think um, it has been educational for us. It isn't just a question of asking for more representation of women, but for example, as an interventional cardiologist, what we have done as we explored diseases that impact women, we've learned more about spontaneous coronary artery dissections. We've learned more about myocardial infarctions with normal coronary arteries and so on, and the role of intracoronary imaging and algorithms and so on. Um, so I think there's a lot to learn from doing these projects. I'm most grateful for the men and women on this panel and other panels that have actually helped me grow as an interventional cardiologist, as a physician and as the person. And perhaps Dr. Waxman doesn't actually know, but my first speaking opportunity as faculty was at CRT. So the previous speaking opportunities that I had, I was a fellow in training. But when I became an established cardiologist, the one meeting that gave me an opportunity and was a launching pad for me was actually CRT. Uh, and I got many more afterwards, TCT and so on. So I'm, I'm most grateful for the men and women that encourage us to learn more about our fields and believe in ourselves and, and grow along with the field. So I'll, I'll stop here and give others a chance to say something. So I'm going back to California. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Dr. Waxman, I just need you to promise me one thing. Can we have that live cast lab with all women operators from your center for 2021? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we 2021 <laughs> is going to be virtual session. Of course. First, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored to be uh, first time in this session that you've been doing. Um, I would tell you something personal. I just about two hours ago, I got the vaccine. So if I say something stupid, I would blame it to the, to the Pfizer side effects. But we'll so blame I, it on Pfizer, don't worry. Yeah, I, I feel very fine and fortunate to be among all of you. And, and I'll tell you one of the things we've started at CRT over a decade ago to do a special session for women in interventional cardiology because we were missing them in the lab and we felt that uh, there are two issues here. One is professionally and the other one is obviously to take care of women who really needs procedure, which we all know about the disparity and who can bridge it better than women. And that has been actually a very successful program, uh, but we really need to break it by doing something that would be really make the news and 
make the women believe that they can do it. And that's brought us about, uh, I think uh, that was about two years ago, or three years ago now, to 2018, uh, that we had the all women case in interventional cardiology. Uh, I still remember that all the men in the panel were pushed out, but I think the key issue was to show that women can do the intervention and they actually doing it better than men sometimes. Uh, and I would say that if there would be head to head comparison or contest, I'm sure that they're gonna feel as good as men in doing it. And I think it is important, first of all, because we need more women in the field of interventional cardiology. As you know, many of them has been in practice, in training, but for many reason left because they saw difficulties and there is no reason that should be any difficulties. The other thing, um, I don't think that there is anybody else that can represent women and closing gap for women diseases and then women. And they, that's why we, we have to do it. I mean, it, we have to empower them. So uh, this is a small contribution that we did uh, at CRT. We continue to, uh, with this program, uh, I'm, you know, Grateful to see Mirvat here because I do remember your first talk. I usually try to come to see some of those and you became a superstar. I mean, you're on every meeting, on every panel, everybody knows you, you publish, you write, and that should be for everyone. So if this was a little contribution just to show that that can be done. We just have to take this as a model and to continue to grow it. And last thing I would say, um, Nanette Wenger, I have so much admiration to her since my days at Emory. And that was almost 20 years ago. And even at that time, I never asked her personally, but I asked why we have only one Nanette? I mean, it should be many of those. So uh, this is a role model and example. And again, anything that I can do to uh, multiply and multiply this success and spread the word and strength the organization of women for interventional cardiology and cardiology in general, uh, you have me committed to help with that part. Thank you so much, Dr. Waxman. So I'm finally going back to California. <laughs> Dr. Barry Merch, thank you so much for your leadership and your mentorship and the sponsorship for all of us who want to work. Is there something you would like at least to share with us about your feelings or if you're not in a mood, we'll let you be. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be an invited panelist. Thank you for including me. Obviously this is near and dear work to all of our hearts. Um, it's wonderful to see a panel that has so many men. Um, I think that's actually critically important uh, because, uh, well, because we need men Men do good work too. Uh, and also because we have an undersupply of women in the field um, and yet 52% of the population is female. Uh, I took Dr. Nanette Wenger's uh, advisement many years ago uh, to task. So we have done a lot of investigation. We have investigated. And in addition to characterizing um, and deep phenotyping different forms of uh, cardiovascular disease that kill women, but are not as often recognized and or treated. Um, we've also done um, social investigation. Uh, the Women's Heart Alliance did a knowledge attitudes and belief survey, which we published in Jack about three years ago. And, um, you know, what that demonstrated is these younger women are very shamed by weight management. And I, I think that's a key issue. We, we're in an obesity epidemic. This is before COVID. Uh, and young women don't want to hear the message and are not absorbing the message despite it being widely broadcast by the AHA and many other good organizations, Women Heart. So moving on, Dr. Wenger, then we have to advocate. And the Women's Heart Alliance um, has continued through the pandemic uh, to work across the aisles uh, to develop um, national programs that hopefully would become also uh, state and local. Um, we've uh, expanded, um, believe it or not, there's another WISE program, WISE Women program, which is a screening, CDC, 
uh, cardiovascular screening in women. And um, we've been successful in expanding that um, to additional states. Uh, and, and of course, you know, there's state and there's local um, stuff going on. And I would encourage all of you to work on this because if you don't address the knowledge, the attitudes and beliefs, and we see this obviously, you know, with what's going on now about trying to understand Facebook and the impact that that has on so many aspects of our daily lives, we will fail in this mission um, of educating not only our communities, but you know, our, our healthcare providers are part of the same community and they often have the same implicit bias um, that is societal. Um, and then uh, last but not least, we are working hard on Dr. Wenger's legislate. And uh, I serve on the FDA renal advisory panel. Um, this is all in the federal register, plus you can read it in Medscape. Um, but I advocated strongly in evaluating the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction drugs um, that the threshold for low ejection fraction for women be 57 and not 55, which is what everybody's advocating for. And once again, we'll miss the women because women, we've described this for decades, women have higher ejection fractions than men in health and disease. So this is where we then, you know, have to really go is we have to investigate, as Dr. Wenger says, we have to advocate and then we have to legislate. So um, I challenge all of us um, to pick, pick something to, you know, one, one aspect of this or do the whole thing. Um, and, you know, then we'll talk about it in these panels and talk about things that work and things that didn't work. Shouting does not work. <laughs> I'll end with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry Mertz. And since we were talking exactly about the miracle rec recipe about uh, investigate, educate, advocate, and legislate, I'm going to uh, call Dr. Lewis to tell us a bit about a new adventure of uh, ACC that she's been championing. And afterwards, I'm going to let Dr. Wenger and, uh, and, and, and Dr. Mitchell close. Uh, with their their feelings on how this afternoon went and what are their ideas we should maybe do in 2021. Dr. Lewis, thank you so much. Thank you, Biliana. Um, you know, I listened to this wonderful group and I feel so honored to be part of it. And Biliana, thank you and congratulations to you for your third annual. I look forward to them in the future. When Dr. Wenger speaks about investigating, educating, advocating, legislating, I think these are all key, but then I'd like to add another eight and that is to create. Um, what can we create to bring these messages forward? And I know that as a, a practicing cardiologist, I come from a non-academic background. For me, when I hit mid-career and my kids left home, I became a clinical investigator. I was, uh, uh, I was able to participate in some of the uh, landmark trials. And actually that's, I think, when I met Dr. Wenger the first time because I was lucky to be put on writing groups for some of these trials. Uh, since there weren't very many women in cardiology, I got to participate at a level just because I was a woman investigator, uh, not necessarily because of uh, work that I had done up to that point, but very much involved in the ability to grow my career mid-career and to uh, branch out into areas that uh, were made possible by my colleagues, both he and she, who in the Heart Association, in the ACC, who were uh, able to make doors open. But I, I look back and I have two daughters. I'm one of those people with daughters uh, who are both physicians. And I see that, that there are not enough other role models and uh, mentors for them and, and leaders going forward to help bring the next generation forward. So as I become a more senior cardiologist, my dream is to make 
possible for mid-career women who are at that stage when they're ready to, to bloom, they have 20 more years, 30 more years of professional life ahead of them uh, to look for the next. You know, what, what dreams might they have that are new? Uh, and I think COVID has really emphasized the potential of this time because we've all been forced into a, a more constrained world uh, where we've had a lot of time to think about life and illness and mortality. So I'm very excited that we're starting the uh, Sandra J. Lewis Women's uh, Mid-Career Leadership Institute. Uh, we'll have a cohort of women that will hopefully find their next and become the mentors and the, the leaders for the next generation. So I look forward to, to reaching out to all of you on this panel for help in uh, designing the curriculum and moving things forward and identifying, especially identifying some women who we don't know well. Um, some of those women who have been really immersed in their own worlds, um, but have tremendous potential. So Ileana, thank you, but let's create along with our investigate, educate, advocate and legislate. Bilyana, I think you're muted. Yeah. Yes, I was. <laughs> so, thank you so much once more. I would like to to actually give us it's sitting, but it's a standing ovation to our fellowship program director, Professor Neshkovich, for for all his he for she advocacy around here, and uh, he, the Neshkovich family. That's a medical family has been going through really nightmares of all worst cases scenario nightmares of COVID during the past weeks. So I promise that I just won't pester him to talk too much and uh, so I would just like to thank him now and uh, with that with that before I, I, I turn to Dr. Wenger uh, and Dr. Mitchell if he wishes to share something at, before we wrap up I would just like to take this opportunity to thank Women as One Dr. Moran couldn't be with us today, but Women as One were, were an amazing group that they are. They reached out and they are also our co-organizers of this event today. And also to give a huge shout out to two to amazing WIC who are on, on the, uh, uh, on, uh, on the, uh, in the audience today, and that is Dr. Shelley Zero, who, who's a heart failure guru from Canada, and uh, Dr. Silvia Castelletti, uh, a sports cardiology uh, expert from uh, from just across the Adriatic in uh, in Italy. So thank you both so much for being with us today, and also tweeting. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, is there something that you would like to share with us before we give word to Dr. Wenger? Uh, thank you. I'm just so honored to be here. I'm going to. I'm not going to pick on one of your. Uh, panel members, but I want to commend Dr. Von Gilbert for her work and, and remind you, I, living in D.C., this complex city where we felt not only the COVID impact on minority women and men, but we also had a faculty member who experienced that uh, the women's impact on health during a normal pregnancy and as she related that, I think the equity that this group takes on should really look at those areas we don't understand as well. It may be access, it may be all of that, but I think the pressure on us. So keep up the good work, Dr. Von Gilbert, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wenger, for allowing me to be here. Dr. Wenger. Yes, first, let me tell you how proud I am of you as one of my academic daughters because you've put together a stunning symposium and you've managed to get so many people worldwide involved. And this is where cooperation should be. You know, I think my leadership style is very different from most people. Most people have a top down. My leadership style is really bottom up. And what I've tried to do over the decades is simply to enroll people in my vision. And once that happens, I let them fly. And what I have seen today is the phenomenal result of the people who have chosen their own pathway, who have flown, who have not only survived, but who have thrived 
and who are going to make the world a better place for women. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you all so much. Let's call it a day. We're four minutes after our planned uh, uh, end of the session, but thank you all and I look forward to hosting you in 2021 in Belgrade. Thank you. Thank Alex, you, Juliana and Alex. Offline. Thank you 